first of the those prophets that are called the minor prophets coming just after Daniel. And we pointed out that uh, Hosea lived in the northern kingdom during the time that that kingdom was taken captive by uh, the Assyrians. And uh, it's his uh, duty, his uh, assignment to uh, prophesy to these, not to turn them to righteousness, because we're going to find from his, his prophecy that they had already gone beyond the, uh, the place where uh, they, could he they would be able to hear a call to repentance. But um, much as was the case with Isaiah, he was uh, vindicating God, showing why God was just in, uh, in letting this nation be captured. And it was also his assignment to explain that Judah, the southern kingdom, would be spared for a time. During uh, the first three chapters of the book, we're told about the relationship between Hosea, the prophet, and his wife. She was unfaithful. God let him know before he married her that she would be unfaithful. And, uh, but uh, he told him to go ahead and marry her anyway and uh, because it was an analogy. It would help him in getting across the message that uh, was necessary for him to, to preach to a, to a nation that had been particularly called by God but who had rejected him in favor of the religions of the heathen nations around about them. Now, last time together, we covered the first eight verses of the first chapter. We'll read those eight, chapter, eight verses again because it's quite necessary to have the background of those eight verses in order to understand the rest of the first three chapters. So Hosea, chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go and take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblaim, uh, who conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel, and she conceived again and bore a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name lo uh, For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away, and I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, or by horsemen. Now when she had, con uh, had weaned, lo she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name lo for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Now as we read along, we'll find this, that uh, um, the prophet Hosea uh, loved very much this young woman, Gomer, and uh, uh, she bore him a son, and uh, we're told that it was his son. But uh, he was already warned by God that uh, she would become a harlot and she would bear children in harlotry. Uh, but we know that the first child uh, was not uh, uh, illegitimate uh, because uh, it specifically says she bore him a son. And that language is not used for the other children. And since there are only three children named, and because of the names God told him to give them, we can come to a conclusion that the uh, other two of her children were not his, although she was married to him at the time she bore them. Now we find that uh, Hosea lived during the reign of uh, four kings in the uh, uh, southern kingdom, 
And uh, this means that his reign, I mean, his prophecy extended over a long period of years. And then he uh, reigned during uh, uh, the reign of Jeroboam II in the northern kingdom, which was Israel. When, it, uh, when we find in verse 2, it says, take the uh, wife of whoredoms or harlotry. Uh, we can tell by the, the rest of the story that, that that does not infer that she was such at the time they were married. But uh, God forewarned him that she would become such. And in the latter part of that verse, he makes the analogy for the land, that is the land of Israel, commits great harlotry, departing from the Lord. Now, uh, we'll, if you're familiar with Old Testament scriptures at all, uh, you know that um, for God's people to give their allegiance to uh, anyone other than their God is considered spiritual harlotry. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the um, analogy we have here. So the first child was born to Hosea, and his name was Jezreel. That's the name of a city in a valley and uh, w with much history, and it, it means sown by God, or and sowing means to scatter the seed. And it received that name because it was so fertile and so productive that uh, the people said that uh, uh, anything that was planted there would be as though it were planted by God that would be so luxurious and so forth, and that's how the valley uh, received its name. And this uh, boy was to be uh, named that because something was going to be sown by God in the valley and it wouldn't be a lush uh, crop, but rather Israel would be scattered. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the inference of the name. And uh, it says that in the fifth verse it says that he would break the bow of Israel. That means Israel or the northern kingdom would no longer be able to fight wars. Their, their fighting ability would be completely taken away. Jehu uh, was the great grandfather of uh, Jeroboam that we find in the first verse, and he was promised by God that his, that his uh, family would reign for four generations, and then because of their wickedness, they would be cut off. So this is what's referred to there. Now, in verse 6, we'll see that Gomer had a, a little girl, and uh, her name means unpitied or not cared for, uh, meaning that uh, the girl wouldn't have a legitimate father that would take the position of a father in her relationship, and uh, she wouldn't have the advantage of being cared for like a girl with a father. And uh, this was predictive of the fact that God was going to cease caring for or watching over or taking pity upon as the case may be, the nation of Israel, that he would let them go into captivity. Then in, uh, uh, in this verse 7, uh, we, we're told that Judah, the southern kingdom, would be pitied, and they would be saved, but not by any military might. And this is in reference to the fact that when the Assyrian armies came against that little southern kingdom, which was much more ill-prepared to defend itself, that... Uh, God sent one angel and uh, killed 185,000 of them. I, this is so spectacular that God put it in the Bible for us three times. Uh, you can find it in, uh, in 2 Kings, and uh, you can find it in Isaiah and 2 Chronicles. Then, uh, as soon as uh, the first little girl was old enough, uh, she, had, uh, she had a son that also uh, was, uh, was not legitimate, and uh, his, uh, God told Hosea to call that one uh, Loami, which means not my people. Uh, it was not Hosea's, and uh, this was God's way of so saying that uh, he would reject Israel from being his people, the people that had been called his people. Now we progress on into verse 10. I said we, we had completed eight verses last week. Actually, it was nine, the nine that we have already read. Now it should be quite clear that the first verse of chapter 2 uh, goes with um, 
these next two verses. So we'll read right through the chapter division. Let the number of the children of Israel, yet the number of the children of Israel, shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, uh, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Say ye unto the, your brethren, that is, Hosea the prophet, you say to your fellow citizens, Say unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Now, Ami means my people, and uh, Ruhamah means having obtained pity. Well, God is letting Hosea prophesy here that one day the people will come back to God. God will call his people back to himself. And we're going to see in our story of Hosea and his wife that Hosea is going to call his wife back to himself after she had forsaken him for other lovers, just like Israel forsook his God, uh, Israel, the nation forsook Israel's God uh, for, uh, uh, for other gods. And this is going to complete the story uh, as we have it presented in the first three verses. Now this uh, latter part of verse 10 is quoted several times in the New Testament when God is explaining his purposes with the nation of Israel. You'll see it will be quoted again in the last verse of chapter 2. We want to read that a moment. In chapter 2, verse 23, And I will sow her unto me in the earth. This is, a, again, a play on this name Jezreel. Just as he had sort of sown the valley or uh, and scattered the seed and sown their destruction, he's going to sow again and they will prosper. For, and I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her uh, that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them who are not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Now this uh, verse 23, and also verse 10 of chapter 1, as we said, were, are quoted several times in the New Testament, and we might look at a couple of those so that you can see the context. First in Romans chapter 9. In this whole section of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul is explaining to us God's program for Israel. And he's making it clear to us that uh, you cannot be saved just because you're an Israelite. Neither uh, are you doomed because you're an Israelite. And that one day God will call the nation back to himself. See in... Uh, in Romans chapter 9, verse 25. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place where, I was, where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, uh, there, shall, uh, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Israel, uh, Isaiah also crieth out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. And uh, Paul goes on in this, uh, this section and explains that God's going to call Israel back to himself. See, uh, in chapter 11, verse 25 of Romans, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there cometh out of, uh, out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, that I shall take away their sins. So uh, he's, he's telling the people of his time, the Apostle Paul is, that God has not forsaken the nation of Israel forever. Now let's look in 1 Peter chapter 2 and we'll see another reference to Hosea. Someone has found nine different places in the New Testament where the book of Hosea is quoted. And so that should be ample evidence of its uh, uh, 
it's its part in the sacred scriptures that these New Testament writers would quote that many times and we'll see that the Lord himself quotes from this prophet Hosea so in first Peter chapter 2 verse 10 who in times past were not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy see he's uh, carrying out the theme of those two names uh, they they were not cared for or pitied by God now they will be they were not his people now they are his people and so we're we're seeing one end of the picture in Hosea and then uh, a later snapshot you might say of the progression on back in the New Testament and so we know at New Testament times uh, this coming back had not yet reached its fulfillment because those New Testament writers told us that that event of Israel coming back to God was still in the future. So we know it is not speaking of uh, the uh, regathering after the captivities. You remember that uh, Hosea prophesied 700 and some years before Christ and during his prophecies the northern ten tribes were taken captive by uh, Assyria. And then a hundred and some years later, the southern kingdoms were taken captive by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar and all of his forces. And then uh, they were captive for 70 years, as had been prophesied by Jeremiah, that they would have to spend 70 years in captivity. And then they would be released to come back to their country. But this was not a full restoration by, uh, on the part of God. Uh, as a matter of fact, only a very small percentage of them chose to come back because the land was still desolate. And so uh, we find out by consulting the New Testament that this regathering after the captivities, which occurred 500 and some years before Christ, was not the ultimate regathering. You see, this is uh, sometimes taught by uh, modern uh, theological um, interpretations that all of these future prophecies concerning Israel had their fulfillment in the return to the land by a portion of them after the captivities. But all you have to do is read scriptures like Hosea and then read their quotes, read the quotations from that scripture in the New Testament and you can clearly see that uh, uh, that which Isaiah prophesied, I mean that which Hosea prophesied, has not yet been fulfilled because Paul said it wouldn't be until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That means until God is finished calling out a people for his name from among the nations of the world. And God's still doing that. That's what God is doing in the world today. God is calling out a people for his name. He's doing that in the nations all over the world. We just told you about a crusade that went on in the city of Santiago in Chile. And God called out 270-some, at least to the extent that we're able to, to tally. Uh, we may not, it may have been somewhat more or less than that. But those, uh, uh, at least to the extent that we have that ability, we, uh, we can uh, see that God called out 270 uh, there from among those people who look, as I said, to the statue of the Virgin Mary for their salvation. And they've received... Uh, the Savior, because that's what God is doing in the world today. And that's why we have a part in sending these young people to the ends of the earth. Uh, that's why my son's in the country of Portugal, because when God says he's calling out a people for his name, some of those people that he's calling out are in Portugal. And uh, you know, all you have to do is go there and find out that there are not adequate ministers, to, among the young people at least, to call out those that God wants called out so he sends some from this country and uh, when we were down in uh, Argentina we saw s four uh, dynamic uh, good-looking young people two couples of Argentines that he's called out from Argentina uh, to go call out some people for his name in Uruguay and uh, we were there at the commissioning service so all over the world God is calling out a people for his name and he's not through doing that yet and Israel is not going to be called back. The time about which Hosea is prophesying here in these three verses uh, is still future. So let's read them again. 
in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. That's future. Now, it has had a partial fulfillment in the fact that God has called out individuals like the Apostle Paul, for instance, and the Apostle Peter from among uh, the nation of Israel, and it still is today. Verse 11, Then, when, this is still future, Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel, or that is, when God will sow. Uh, and ye and say unto your brethren, Ami. In other words, when Hosea can say that uh, there will be his people and they will have obtained pity. So verses 10 through chapter 2, verse 1, speak of a time which is still future in our day. It has not yet come to pass. Now, beginning in verse 2 of chapter 2, uh, Hosea is given some instructions by God, and uh, Hosea is being spoken of as a child of God, and the nation of Israel is spoken of as his mother. And this is uh, uh, has its roots uh, in uh, the 50th chapter of Isaiah, uh, of course. So uh, uh, Hosea is said in uh, saying in chapter 2, verse 2, or God is saying to Hosea, uh, to contend or plead with your mother. Contend, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. In other words, she has taken herself out of that relationship. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms or her harlotry out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her thirst. Now, this is speaking primarily of spiritual thirst, and this happened. Uh, he took away all of her righteousness or her kinship to him. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they are the children of whoredoms. In other words, the, the descendants of the Israelites of that day would, be, uh, would not be children of God, as uh, the majority of Israelites are not today. That is to say... Uh, they're not in the family of God, as a group, that is. And this is prediction of that, just like uh, his children, that, or the children that Gomer uh, bore, uh, these were not his children. Verse 5, For their mother hath played the harlot, she, ha she that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me bread and water, and my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. In other words, she was, uh, although Hosea was supplying her needs, well, she was uh, giving uh, her lovers credit for it. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up the way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not uh, find her paths. In other words, she's going to come to a bad end. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. Now, he's predicting... Uh, something about his own wife's future and something about Israel's future. He's saying the time will come when uh, her lovers don't want to have any more to do with her. And she pursues them, but they won't have her. And so she says, well, my, things are not so good. I think I'll go back to my husband because things were better with me then. And uh, Hosea is going to be told by God to take her back because it'll be a picture of the fact that although Israel, as a nation, left Israel's God, God one day will take Israel back to be his special people. And this was to be a picture of it. Verse 8, For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Now, he's referring to the nation. What they were doing they were thanking the heathen god Baal for all of their physical sustenance. In other words, uh, when uh, 
when Ahab, the king of Israel, married Jezebel, you'll remember, Jezebel had all the prophets of God slain and brought in prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal taught the people that Baal was their provider, that Baal was giving them crops, and Baal it was that caused them to have uh, uh, corn or grain and wine and oil and silver and gold. And so they worshipped him and gave him thanks for what God had provided for them because they lived in the valley of Jezreel, which was a, a very fertile valley. Uh, so he says in verse 9, Therefore will I return and take away uh, my corn in its time and my wine in its season and will recover my wool and my flax and to cover, and to cover her nakedness. What God is saying, saying, Look, I'm giving you all of these things and you're giving the credit to it, to the false god that you're worshiping. He says, All right, I'll take it away and let's see what Baal does for you. And Baal's not going to do anything for him. And they're going to realize that, that they were given allegiance to the wrong God. Now this phrase, uh, corn, or is in some of your Bibles, grain, in the King James Version, it's, uh, it's uh, translated corn, corn, wine, and oil. You'll find that phrase used throughout the scriptures when it's speaking of the prosperity that will belong to this nation Israel in their own land. Let's look back at some of the scriptures where that's used. You're going to find in the next book, uh, after we finish Hosea, we'll be studying Joel, and you're going to find this quite frequently. Uh, corn and wine and oil. Uh, let's look uh, back in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it's speaking uh, of this place. Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you will hearken to these judgments, and keep them, and do them, that the Lord thy God will keep unto thee the covenant and the mercies which he swore unto thee, and he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee, and he will also bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, and thy oil. Thine oil. Then look in chapter 11 of Deuteronomy. He's telling them, now, you'll recall Deuteronomy uh, consists of a series of lectures or admonitions on the part of Moses, just before Moses died. And these uh, uh, sermons by Moses were given to the second generation of Israelites. You'll remember the first gener generation all died in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two that were permitted to go over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And Moses, just before his death, you'll remember Moses didn't go over the, over the river Jordan into the promised land. He died on the east side. But he's uh, bringing all these things to the rem uh, rem remembrance, all the things that happened to their parents in coming out of Egypt and in wandering in the wilderness. And here he's explaining to them the glories of the land in which, which they're going. Now, many of them remembered Egypt because those who died in the wilderness, consigned to, to death in the wilderness, were only those who were at least 20 years old at the time they refused to go into the Promised Land at Kadesh Barnea. And some of these to whom Moses is speaking were in their teens at the time they were slaves in Egypt. So they would remember that quite well. And now they're in their 50s and 60s, or they're in their 50s, uh, the oldest ones of them are. And so he's telling them uh, what... Uh, what is going to be for them. Look in uh, Deuteronomy 11.10. For the land to which thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from where you came out, where thou sowed thy seed and watered it with your foot as a garden of herbs. If you wanted vegetables, you wanted to eat there, you had to pump the water up with your foot because it didn't rain in Egypt. You know, all the water had to come up out of the Nile. And uh, he says... In verse 11, But the land to which you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinks in the water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God cares for. You see, this is the opposite from the, the name of the child, uh, which meant not pitied or cared for, uh, the uh, first little girl that was born to harlotry. And a land which the Lord thy God cared for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. 
And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which they didn't, uh, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, which they didn't, they loved their false gods, and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, and they didn't, that if they'll do that, I will give you the rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain. Now we're going to find out quite a lot about first rain and latter rain also in the Minor Prophets. We'll find it in Hosea, and we'll find it in Joel, and we'll find it in some of the other Minor Prophets. There are certain of these uh, phrases that are used quite frequently in the Minor Prophets, and they, they have a spiritual meaning. The, uh, the uh, former rains and the latter rains have a meaning. And we'll get into that when we find uh, that phrase the first time in Hosea. That uh, I will give you the rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, and thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Now, uh, we're given a little insight into what uh, some of these mean in, uh, in a strange parable that we have in the book of Judges. Uh, the seventh book of the Old Testament, in Judges chapter 7. No, in Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9, verse 8. And the trees went forth once to anoint a king over them, and they, uh, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherein by me they honor God and man, and be promoted over the trees. And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou reign over us. And the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Now, uh, wherever you see the olive tree, or the fruit of the olive tree, which is oil, when you see oil in the Bible, it doesn't mean what you pump up out in Oklahoma. It's speaking of olive oil. And uh, the, uh, so when you see the olive tree or the olive oil, it means something spiritually. And when you see the fig tree, it means something. And when you see the, the vine or the fruit of the vine, it means something. And you're going to come across these very frequently. Uh, we, we won't try to prove it just now, but we'll make the statement, and then you'll see it'll fit each time we come to it. Uh, corn spiritually means uh, sustenance by God. It, it, when you're receiving the corn, the old corn of the land, as we find first in, in Joshua chapter 5, God is obligating himself to do the part of the provider. That's why he's called the husband of Israel, because he takes that part to provide. And so corn stands for sustenance. With us, the spiritual application, it's Christ sustaining us spiritually. And when you see the, uh, the wine, it stands for uh, our fellowship with God. When, when uh, Israel is enjoying their wine, they're having fellowship with God. It cheereth the heart of both God and man. You saw that in, in Judges. So it speaks spiritually of God as he's fellowshipping with his people. Uh, you get some of this significance in the New Testament where it speaks of he's the vine and we abide in him. You also get it in the, the story of the miracle of the turning the water into wine, the, uh, uh, the empty pots of earth stood for the nation of Israel and their formal religion, and uh, Christ was going to uh, take uh, and make the wine the water, of course, is, is the cleansing power of the Spirit. And when he, when he gives life, well, then the joy flows forth. Now, this is a picture. It's, it's joy in the Lord uh, as you have fellowship with him. And oil, when it's used figuratively, uh, is speaking of the power of God, the empowering by God. And so when we speak of, of corn and wine and oil and apply it to us, we're speaking about uh, the sustenance that we receive through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, feeding on the risen Christ, what he does in us and through us. And when, uh, when the wine is used, it's, it's when we're in communion with him, when we're, uh, when we're enjoying fellowship with our God. And the oil is when he's empowering us, when he's pleased to do his work through us. So for Israel, 
to have corn and wine and oil means that God is going to sustain them and God is going to fellowship with them and God is going to use them. He's going to empower them for his use, what he's doing. And when he takes away the corn and the wine and the oil, it means that he's no longer going to sustain them, he's no longer going to fellowship with them, and he's no longer going to use them to do his work in the world. And that's what Hosea is prophesying. Now, if I make a statement like that, uh, it's perfectly proper that you should say, well, don't just uh, uh, say it, show it to us in the scriptures. Well, what I'm saying in our study of the New Testament, I mean in, the, in our study of uh, these uh, minor prophets, you're going to have ample opportunity uh, to prove that, to see if it fits, because it's going to be used quite frequently. And if you want to do some proving on your own, just uh, uh, get a concordance and follow it all the way through, and you'll see that, uh, that it fits uh, the, uh, the typology. So back in Hosea chapter 2, verse 8, For she did not know that I gave her the corn. I, it was I that was uh, uh, sustaining her. And the wine, it was... It was, I was their God with whom they were to have fellowship. They were not going to, uh, supposed to go to the hilltops and, and offer their uh, allegiance to false foreign gods. And uh, I was going to give them the oil. It was through, through them that my work on earth would be done. And multiplied her silver and her gold. Well, silver, when it's used figuratively in the Bible, speaks of God's mercy through his redemptive program. The, the God's purpose in bringing the nation of Israel into that special land of uh, corn and wine and oil, or milk and honey, which has another connotation, but his purpose for bringing them into that land was to, uh, to teach them his ways that they might bring the whole world to the true God. That was their assignment. But they didn't fulfill that assignment. They disdained being used for God's redemptive purposes. So, uh, he gave them silver, offered to enlarge their borders, both physically and spiritual, and they disdained that. So he's going to take away their silver, or their right, to be a part of his redemptive program. And of course, this is exactly uh, what's meant in uh, the New Testament, when God speaks of us building with gold, silver, or precious stones. It, it's the same application, because now he's using us to show forth his mercy in his redemptive program. And of course, the gold here stands for uh, deity in manifestation. Someone said gold stands for deity, but it really is more than that. It's deity in manifestation. It's God showing himself forth, showing his excellencies. And you see the vision of Christ in Revelation, he's girded about with gold. It means that in all of this, he's showing forth God's excellencies. And when you see all of the uh, items in the tabernacle, the uh, altar of incense uh, was wood overlaid with gold. The uh, Ark of the Covenant was wood overlaid with gold. The mercy seat was wood overlaid with gold. Uh, the table of showbread, uh, wood overlaid with gold. You see, this the wood was the humanity of Christ, but it's as Christ showed forth the excellencies of God on earth. He was a human being, a uh, overlaid with gold, so to speak. And so Israel assignments, Israel's assignment was to be a part of God's redemptive program and to show forth his glories at silver and gold. And they were to be sustained by him, have fellowship with him, and to be empowered by him. And that's what all this means figuratively in this verse 8. In all of this, they disdained. God couldn't use them because uh, they didn't... Uh, uh, meet the conditions. So verse 9 again, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in its time and my wine in its season and will recover my wool and flax to cover her nakedness. Now, this wool and flax speaks of the fact the white linen, uh, and the white is wool and white linen speaks of being clothed with the righteousness of God. When God calls out a people for his name, uh, he clothes them in righteousness that they might do his holy work. And when we're doing the work of God in this world. We're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And that's the only reason God can use us. And so uh, 
they chose to be unclothed, so to speak, uh, disdained the righteousness of God that they might do his work in this world. So chapter 2, verse 10, And now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbath, and all of her solemn feasts. Now you'll remember that God had given them three different times of festivities during the year that they might come and fellowship and know that they had a relationship with their God. There was one in the early spring, which was called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and that was during that time they also had the Passover and the, uh, and the first fruits. And then later, 50 days later, there was the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost at the end of the harvest, spring harvest. And then there were the, the solemn uh, the fall festivities centered around the Feasts of the Tabernacles. You can read a, a detailed description of these festivities in uh, Leviticus chapter 23 and a less detailed account in various other places. But he says they wouldn't have that anymore. This was their means of fellowshipping with their God. Verse 12, And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees. Now, we saw the fig tree over in... in uh, we saw uh, the fig tree in uh, the book of Judges also. And uh, the fig tree stands for Israel in material prosperity. And... Uh, uh, and fruitfulness. Uh, pros it's really prosperity. When the fig tree is bearing figs, uh, Israel is prosperous. That's why in the New Testament, Christ told the story. It says, uh, when you see uh, the fig tree budding forth, you'll know that the end is near. In other words, it's going to be time for Israel to prosper again. The fig tree is going to bear. When Jesus was here, uh, remembered, he, he looked at the fig tree and they made a show of prosperity, but there weren't any figs on the tree, were there? Uh, so uh, Israel didn't have true prosperity, but one day there'll be fig trees. Uh, there's a story in Jeremiah. God tells them to get two baskets of figs, and one basket has good figs and the other has bad figs. Well, this is the story of, of their fruitfulness going to rot, so to speak. And this will fit all through there. So the fig tree stands for their prosperity, and they were prosperous at the time of the reign of Jeroboam the second. But he says uh, that that would not be. See verse 12 again, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. What Israel was saying, they were getting their, uh, their fellowship from false gods and their prosperity from false gods these uh, religious practices that had to do with Baal, it was very licentious. It all had a, uh, an evil sexual connotation. And uh, uh, the uh, prophet says, well, look, uh, this is all, Baal has offered this for your pleasure. And it was uh, that type of a, of a pleasure that they were enjoying. That was, so to speak, their wine. And uh, they were giving uh, the false god the credit. See, God had laws against that but their false gods would let them uh, have whatever type of uh, sensual uh, uh, practices they, their hearts desired. That's one of the reasons they worshiped the false gods. Verse 13, uh, he says, I will visit upon her or judge for her the days of Balaam unto which she burned incense and she decked herself with earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord, speaking now of Israel. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak tenderly unto her, and I will give her her vineyards, fence, and the valley of Acre for a door of hope, and she shall sing there in the days of her youth, as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. You see, wherever God predicts desolation and destruction, and judgment, he predicts the far end when he's going to bring Israel back into fellowship. And this is what these verses speak of. You see, verse 14 is looking beyond the time of Israel's uh, uh, destruction and their banishment from God to a time when he will call Israel back to himself, as is, again, as, as is explained in uh, Romans uh, chapters 9 through 11 by the Apostle Paul. I always 
When you're studying these Old Testament scriptures, it's well to read that portion several times, particularly the 11th chapter, because it put, puts God's program for Israel in focus for us in this day. So back again in verse 14 of chapter 2. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly unto her. And I will give her her vineyards uh, thence and the valley of Achor. Now the valley of Achor is where um, Achan committed his crime and it's the valley of sorrow, which means that, uh, or, or trouble, or which will be a door of hope. So this is speaking of the other side of that time of trouble. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Now the reference of here is to the glorious song that was sung in, uh, in Exodus chapter 15. Hold, the, uh, hold your place here and look back for a moment in Exodus 15. And here's the song that was sung by Israel when they were young, that is to say when they were delivered out of Egypt. See, in uh, Exodus chapter 15, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. Now, this song uh, goes from verse 1 all the way through uh, verse 19. Uh, you have this song of the redeemed, or the people that were, were redeemed out of Exodus, and this is the basis for a number of psalms. As a matter of fact, uh, in Groveland, we're studying the book of Psalms. We've been studying now for some two years. We're going through the whole book of Psalms verse by verse. And uh, let's see, we'll be in the 114th Psalm uh, tomorrow night. But we find that many of the Psalms have their root in this song of deliverance from out of the uh, uh, captivity. And it's this song right here in Exodus 15 to which Hosea is referring in this verse 15, the latter part of, of chapter 2, verse 15, and she shall sing, that is Israel, shall sing there, that is, in the valley of Achor that shall be turned into the door of hope. That's when Christ comes again. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. How did she sing then? She sang as recorded in Exodus chapter 15, the first 19 verses. So if you want to sing... Uh, see the song that was sung there you go back and read that verse 16 and it shall be at that day that is that future day saith the Lord that thou shalt call me Ishai uh, which means my husband and shall no more call me Baali which means Lord in other words they'll have they'll have a relationship like a wife rather than a servant for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth and they shall no more be uh, remembered by their name and in that day Will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things on the ground? I will break the bow and the sword and the battle and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them lie down safely. Now this is referring to the battle of Armageddon when Christ shall come back and fight for the nation of Israel and then shall usher them into the kingdom. That's what's being referred to in verse eighteen. Verse nineteen And I will betroth thee unto me forever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. It says, I'm going to take you back like a, a newborn bride, like someone who's been betrothed. And uh, uh, you'll be righteous, and, uh, and you'll experience my mercies. But it will be that time. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass, and that day I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil. In other words, he's going to take it away, and then he's going to give it back. In other words, there'll be a time when God again will be their sustenance, he will be their joy, and he will be uh, their empowering, and that's when God is going to rule the earth through Israel. When uh, Christ said he was going to Calvary's cross, the disciples asked him, and what will we have, we who have forsaken everything to follow thee? And he says, when I come into my kingdom, you twelve shall sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And God's going to rule the world through Israel. Uh, they will have their corn, their wine, and their oil, and they shall hear Jezreel, and I will sow her unto me in the earth. In other words, uh, the, the valley of Jezreel was called that because it was sown by God. And it says, uh, you're going to be prosperous like the valley of, of Jezreel. 
for I will sow thee uh, unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy unto her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them who were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. So we have this, again, speaking of that time that shall be in the future. Now, in chapter 3, which is only five verses long, God is going to tell Hosea to take his wife back. And uh, that will be a picture of how God will take Israel back one day. But there's some qualifications, some things that, that uh, she must do. And by this time, she's gone completely down in the depths. Uh, she's uh, past the time when she's had the bloom of youth and she could attract her paramours. And now uh, she finds she has to chase after them because she's lost her allurements and they won't, they're not interested in her. And so she finds herself uh, sold as a common slave. And to get her back, her husband, Hosea, has to buy her out of the slave market that which was his own, and with that, that which he provided, he must buy, purchase back, when nobody else wants her. And yet, uh, the slave's price must be paid. And that, of course, and when applied to us, is a picture of the fact that uh, uh, when we were yet without strength, when we were ungodly, Christ died for us. He paid the redemption price uh, for us when we weren't faithful to him. And... Uh, although we are of no value. Uh, Paul uh, says that, uh, that everything he has wasn't even worth what dung was worth. And uh, it was all, uh, it, he was nothing. But yet God called him and God bought him and paid a dear price. So Gomer is going to have to buy his own wife back who he loved and sustained when nobody else even wants her. Because She's uh, sold into slavery, as we were sold into slavery. And this is, of course, a picture. Also, the primary picture is of Israel. When nobody wants Israel, and the whole world will turn against Israel, then God will purchase her out of, uh, out of slavery and call her back to himself. Gomer's wife is a picture of this. So the whole first three chapters are a picture next week. We'll uh, start with the third chapter because, as we pointed out before, it tells Israel's history in the present time. And uh, we'll do a little short review of the first two chapters again. And then chapters 4 through 14 are, uh, are an exposition, as far as Israel's concerned, of this parable. Uh, Hosea's wife will not be mentioned again after the third chapter. And uh, the picture uh, is over. And then Hosea is then going to be asked by God to, uh, to explain why his judgment is being brought upon his people. And uh, then he will also continue all the time he's prophesying judgment. He will prophesy this time in the future when Israel will come back. So the whole prophecy of Hosea concerning Israel arises out of this relationship that Hosea had with his own wife uh, that we find here in the first three chapters. And of course, what we'll be doing, we'll be applying it to our own selves and what Christ has done for us. And uh, you'll see the picture. We'll try to, to draw the, uh, the analogies all through uh, the book as we go through. So that, because, you see, our authority for doing this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 where we're told all these things happened unto them, that is Israel, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come. Everything God wrote about Israel, he wrote for our admonition, and that's why we study books like the book of Hosea, so that we might be admonished by the lessons there. Shall we close in prayer? Father, we... Pray that you'd give us now unusual insight to see uh, what you have to say in this portion of your word. Uh, for you have already told us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be 
perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we thank you for this provision. In Jesus' name, amen.